as possibly the best gamer in the world, there is quite literally no challenge too hard, no feat too unattainable, and no mountain so high that I'd be unable to climb it. Now it's no secret that I enjoy difficult challenges in games. I've completed a rune level 1 run in Elden Ring with a blindfold on. I've done Hitless Path of Pain in Hollow Knight using only my toes, and I actually was the first in the world to complete a Halo 2 Deathless Lasso run back in the summer of 03. Point is, I like a challenge. So when Celeste was recommended to me, touted as an extreme extremely difficult experience, I scoffed, as no game could ever possibly best me. I've just got that schwa, that natural skill, that swagger that allows me to Alright, I'ma come clean. I didn't accomplish those things that I said I did. Except for the Elden Ring blindfold run, which was made more difficult because I didn't realize that I didn't have to put the blindfold on right when I bought the game at the store. While I may not have completed those other challenges, the one that I can truly say I have accomplished is beating Celeste. A short but sweet indie platformer developed by Extremely OK Games and released back in 2018. My time with this game was short, but despite only playing for a runtime of around 6 hours, because fuck the strawberry. It left more of an impact on me than some games I've played for like 50 plus hours. Yes, that is partially because of the difficulty of the game, but it's less so about the difficulty itself than it is the themes and story beats surrounding the difficulty as a medium to tell an intimate story of introspection, determination, depression, and acceptance. This is the story of a mountain named Celeste. Celeste opens to a title screen that sets the story's tone pretty well. It's just you, the mountain, and a slow piano track. Before I get into the story, I'm just gonna throw out there now as a side note that the soundtrack fucking slaps. There's also a second side soundtrack that has all just piano versions of the songs, and that also slaps. There's something to be said about soundtracks lending themselves to the narrative of a game in an extremely positive way, but I'll get back to that in more detail in another video. The game introduces you to the bottom of Celeste Mountain. All you know is that your character is determined to climb the mountain to its summit, and that the other people on this mountain think you're a fucking idiot for wanting to do so. Despite them, you embark on this seemingly impossible trek. Along the way, you're introduced to some key characters like Theo, Bad Grandma, and Ghost with a stick shoved way up his ass. And you, but not you, but is you, but not you, but it is, you, but like a part of it is a separate body part of like own entity as well, but it's also you, but it's not. Let's start with Theo. You come across Theo at the beginning of the game, sometime after you embark on your climb. You chat with him for a little bit about what each of you are doing on the mountain, bonding over the elderly lady at the base of the mountain, who's a little bit of a freaky bitch, and not in a good way. He tells you in a more friendly way than Grandma Hobags that you're kinda of fucking crazy for wanting to climb all the way to the summit. Kinda of crazy in the way that he admires you for your goals and wishes you luck. This is a welcome moment of respite after your first lengthy encounter with that other character I briefly mentioned earlier. That character is introduced as an evil doppelganger version of the player character, who's known canonically as Madeline, but I named her fucking Cloploid, so I'll be referring to her as her canon name from here on out. Sue me for not wanting to tell a story about facing depression and anxiety using Cloploid as the main example name. Evil Madeline chases you for some time, attempting to kill you and convince you to go home, saying that climbing this mountain is beyond your reach and just impossible, along with other demeaning things. This section is extremely nerve-wracking and difficult, so coming to the end of it and having a nice bond moment with Theo is a really solid change of pace. Chapter 3 sees us enter a hotel where we talk with Mr. Oshiro, a ghost of the man who once owned the Celestial Resort Hotel. We never find out how he died, but we do know that when he passed, this hotel meant so much to him that his wayward soul stayed behind to run the operation years and years after it collapsed. As you run through his hotel, you find that he's distant and strange. As he ignores you and panics and talks to himself often, even freaking out to the point of creating red-black globs that gave me literally the worst time I had in this game. You find out Theo has made his way over to the hotel as well, telling you he thinks Oshiro is dangerous and then attempting to escape through the vents. After a long run through the hotel, you finally make it to the top where evil Madeline berates Oshiro for being a failure and a fraud. Obviously, he doesn't take these words in stride and attempt to make his life better through hope and perseverance. 
No. He turns into a bloodthirsty monster and chases you through the fucking hotel. The next time you come across Theo is at the end of chapter 4, where the two of you ride the gondola together to continue climbing up the mountain. Evil Madeline sabotages the rail, which makes Madeline have a panic attack. Theo does something incredible here. He takes the time to listen and calm Madeline down, using a trick where he tells her to imagine a feather floating, telling her to focus on her breath as it's the only thing that will keep the feather up. This works, warding off Evil Madeline, as well as a panic attack, allowing both of you to make it to safety. This gondola leads to the mirror temple, where Theo gets lost on the other side of a mirror that steals him while he tries to take a mirror selfie. Finding his phone, you rush into the temple to find him and get it back to him. As you get deeper in, things begin to warp and change until reality becomes a disgusting shell of itself. You find Theo encased in a glass box of his own making, and you take him and get him out of there, apologizing profusely and explaining that all of that was your fault and maybe you should have given up since the mountain keeps drawing off of what a horrible and worthless person you are. I mean, that's the right thing to do, right? Give up? Surely the mountain would be better off without you having tainted it with your horribleness. But Theo doesn't think so. In fact, Theo thinks the complete opposite. He admires your goals. The fact that you saved his life. The fact that despite the emptiness and craziness of the feelings you feel, he not only believes you, but he believes in you. Here, is where I found my most rewarding moment with the game. Not through the accomplishing of the stupid fucking hotel level, not through acquiring that one next to impossible strawberry, it was here, sitting at a small campfire at the edge of the world with somebody who is more than just a good person, but at his absolute core, a good friend. Despite how Madeline describes herself, Theo refuses to see anything but the good in her. Theo refuses to see Madeline not only give up on her goal, but give up on herself. In a time where having someone to listen to her was so desperately needed, Theo sat and listened without objection. He took the time to understand what she was feeling and where she was coming from and let that become a deep, bond between them. This provided Madeline with the strength and guidance she needed to carry on. Through this strength and the advice of the bitter old lady, after you're knocked back to the bottom of the mountain by evil Madeline, you're able to do something incredible. The old lady tells you that instead of running from the bad things and trying to hide them, you need to make peace with them instead. And so starts a lengthy chase scene that culminates in a hug so deep that Madeline and evil Madeline merge into the same person. With this acceptance of her insecurities, her anxieties, her sadness and self-doubt, Madeline is able to climb to the summit of the mountain and succeed at her goal. At face value, Celeste is a story about triumph when facing seemingly insurmountable goals. But what if I told you that this story isn't just about climbing a mountain? It's not just about giving an evil version of yourself a hug and baking everyone pies that taste like shit after to celebrate. What if I told you that everybody is climbing a mountain? Whether it be Mount Celeste, or depression, or grief, or anxiety, among so many other things. Those feelings, coping with the loss of others, or the loss of direction, or just the loss of feeling, are mountains that seem impossible to climb at times. The difficulty of this game represents how every single day can be a struggle to get up and try again. And the sense of satisfaction you get from completing a section that gives you such a hard time is representative of making it through the toughest days, only to realize who you are and what you bring to the world is valuable. And at our worst, when we feel like all is lost and no one cares, we all need a Theo to help pull us up out of the suffocating oceans of doubt and emptiness. Someone to listen and be there even if they can't fully grasp the depths of our sadness. Sometimes someone just needs to be there. Feelings like this are temporary, and the world is a brighter place with you in it always. But sometimes we need a Theo to help us see it when we can't see it in ourselves. In the same way, we can't always know what mountains other people are climbing. We can't know everyone's struggles and losses. And so, spreading blind kindness and love to those around you is so unbelievably important to lifting up the world. You can be a Theo, always. We can all be Theo. If we were, maybe the world wouldn't seem like such a lonely place. If we were, maybe everyone could climb to their summit and look at the beautiful view. Maybe we all just need a Theo sometimes. Thanks for watching.